Hello. Hello. <laughs> I get left with the two troublesome folks I see to oh. host me. Oh my! Double trouble. Oh my! My my! Uh, I've been besmirched. <laughs> How dare you? No, oh, five dollar words there. <laughs> I see. I see. Yes. Yep. Someone in chat just said it's Layla time, which I imagine means you're a pro wrestler now. So. Yeah, that's a. I, I I give you a shout out in this talk, Steve. So that's Steve talks code, Steve Collins. <laughs> he's awesome. He's my. He's like my pair programming buddy. He probably doesn't want to be my pair programming buddy, but I'll, I'll be like Steve. I'm stuck. <laughs> I do that to Martin as well. I'm like Martin, I'm stuck. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, That's Martin's it. great, and uh, I give him a hard time sometimes. But do he, you? Do you? Do I? Like I daily, don't know. Daily. I don't think so. I don't see a barrage of like stuff on Twitter from you, Kelly. No, no memes, no superimposed faces. <laughs> never. Uh, never. Some are just internal memes because you know. Mm -hmm. Mar Martin yeah. is one of my .NET heroes, and I'm privileged to work with him. So, so just to say that and put that out there, but. We could chat with you all day, but we want to respect your time and the time of our viewers. So uh, if you're ready, we can kind of get to your talk and uh, we'll chat with you sure. afterwards. All righty. Uh, I'll, I'll share your screen uh, and then Rachel and I will leave you to it. On so. your bikes. Get lost. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Hello, everybody, and it's nice to see some familiar folks in the chat there. Howdy doody. Uh, we're not going onto the .NET drama llama meter just yet, uh, and I don't have a problem with llamas. Okay, so uh, Khalid has already told you a bit about who I am. I can't make this any bigger, so I'm sorry, 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 but this is this is me this way. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm looking at myself in the picture. Uh, I'm a, dev a, dev a developer advocate at VMware. Um, I've done all these things, but the more interesting bit is down here, uh, GitHub Layla hyphen P, because all the code I'm going to show you today is on GitHub. Um, so you don't need to, to follow along and jot down notes, but you can. Look, I have a pen. I always have a pen or a pencil or a plethora of them. Here's the pencil on this side. Uh, so as long as you've written that down, you'll be able to find all of this code. And you can find me on Twitter and Twitch under Layla Codes It. Uh, and on the interweb at layla.dev or laylacodes.it, whichever you prefer. Um, so today in, in this one, ASP.NET Basics for Experts. Now, I, I did this talk um, from the perspective of someone maybe coming from another coding language, so say Java, over to .NET. Or someone who maybe has been doing the same thing over and over again in framework and wants to move over to uh, .NET 6. Uh, maybe they're you know wanting to upskill and they want to know how they do the things that they did in framework because there's still so many people running on framework um, to come over to .NET 6. So um, we'll go through top level statements and the minimal hosting model. And those are all sort of new things that came in with .NET 6. Global using directives, dependency injection and inversion of control. That's what IOC stands for. Minimal APIs, we'll touch on those, just a few little uh, tidbits for those. Uh, HTTP clients and client factories. Uh, resiliency and circuit breakers with poly. And so maybe some other stuff. We'll see. I don't, I never, I always say maybe other stuff, but I never have time because I do too much of the chit chat. But that's all well and good. Let's start um, and have a look at where we've come from. Now, we've come from .NET where, I can't speak today. Everything's coming out a bit mumbo jumbo. So, um, .NET 5 Web API. I want to have a look at that to see what we had previously and why .NET 6 is so different. And when .NET 6 came out last year, I threw every toy out of the pram in a strop because I didn't like it. And now I'm like, oh no, all the toys can come back in. I'm much happier with it all. Uh, so let's go and take a look. We have a program file and let's zoom, 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 zoom in. And in here, we've got not a lot going on really we've got 
the main, you know, the program main. I want you just to note all of this indentation and stuff like that. Um, and then we have uh, our host builder and then we're telling it to go over to startup. So let's go and check out startup. And this was my happy place. This is where I did all of my code and, and everything. So if we come in here, let's expand. Oh my goodness, so much space taken up with that. Well, at least Rider minimizes it all for us. So that's a good good thing. Um, but you can see we get our in, in our configuration uh, injected for us and we go and assign that and then we can go and um, start adding things to our IOC container. So that's our inversion of control, which is our container of things we want to use. And that's called iService collection in our application in .NET. Um, and that just comes straight out the box. It's awesome. Dependency injection is just straight in .NET. I love it. No needing to bring in any of those old things like Ninject. I, I had to work with uh, Ninject a long time. Was, there one, was Castle Windsor dependency injection? I can never remember what Castle Windsor was. Anyway, I had to work with that. I can't remember. I blocked it out of my brain. I sucked it out and threw it away because uh, it was all far too stressful. Uh, so this is where we can add our, our services. That's going to annoy me, that big old space. And in here, uh, this is just straight out of a template. And we this is where we would add our services. Uh, so if you had any custom things that you wanted to inject into your controllers, you add them to your services. And then down here, this is the app. And this is your web application. And what we do is add middleware and other things in here and map the endpoints, um, which if you are in framework, you remember you used to do that. I can't even remember. It's so long ago. You used to have to put all your, your mapped endpoints for your controllers in that, that thing down the bottom and, you know, priority list. I can't even remember. So long ago. That's been sucked out of the brain and thrown away as well. So we've got this. Um, and this was all really good. And then Donut 6 came out and said, <laughs> no, none of this. So I think to truly understand this, let's go and make a .NET 6 application. And I'm going to do a minimal APIs one. Uh, let's make a new directory in here called temp. Oh, why? Oh, because I've already got one. Really? I thought I deleted that. No, I didn't. Right, OK, cd into temp. And is there something in there? But it, is, it looks like it's empty. Okay, so let's go and uh, make a new .NET application. So we're going to go .NET new web API. And this time I'm going to just go minimal. And this is going to make us a minimal API. Let's go. Oh, it's a single. Too many of those. Let's go. There we go. Alrighty. So if I go and open this, we'll just have a little, have a look in code. And what we can see is now we have this one program, no startup. Now, if you were working in a console application in .NET 5, you probably didn't have a startup file as well. I always added one because I was so there living in that startup.cs. But oh my goodness, does this not look very different? Let me just go back, look at this program compared to this program. And let me expand those. Well, it's very different. First of all, like we've got these things like namespaces and program and then main and then we do stuff. But here, dun, 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 we don't. It's all gone. I now have this web application up here. And what this means is um, in an effort to get rid of a lot of ceremony from our applications and make it more appealing to developers from other uh, ecosystems, a lot of the ceremony is gone. And that's because this is now a static method. We don't need to put program and main in there. You can, you, you totally still can, but you don't have to. Uh, and so this is a top level statement, which you may have heard about. So now we've got this web application create builder and we have a builder and here, in that builder, we've got an iService collection and we add all of our services just as we did in the startup file. And then once you've added all your services and you've done all of that, everything's added, you can then build it. And this is a web application. So if I just go web application, that will make it clearer. 
Um, and so you can see now we've got this web application. And just like before, you can add all of your um, middleware. This is a minimal API that was with that tag hyphen minimal. So we've got one of those in here, but I totally could add controllers in here if I so wished. So um, that's, that's sort of it. It was, it was quite the change and there's lots of things going on here um, that I'm going to dig into. But let's go and dig into this in my big application, which I've already created. Is uh, over another window. What I just want to do is um, bring you all over, over onto a, another screen. There we go. And is that right? Did I do that the right way? There we go. All right. So I'm testing out desktops on Windows. So I'm a little bit like new to it. So I want to bring you in all your questions over. Okay. And Rachel says, yes, Castle Windsor is an IOC container. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember those. Okay, so I have this application. It is uh, a top level statement and it has uh, minimal APIs and it has controllers because yes, you can totally mix and match them um, completely. No issue whatsoever. All right, so let's have a look here. Now, that was something that we didn't look at on here was why do I have so few using statements here? Because we don't have anything. And that is because of this implicit usings enabled. What that means is that every application comes with a core uh, set of um, references to common NuGet packages that you would use for that application, such as system, yay. So now we don't have to have all of the system stuff just here. So we don't need any of this, it's just, implied because we have implicit usings. So that's a pretty awesome uh, thing in my mind. Uh, but you can see I still have stuff. I do need things like system.text.json. So let's have a look at first how we can get rid of some of the stuff up here because you can totally make your own global usings package. And let's go and do that now. So I'm going to add a new class that'll do and we'll call this you can call this anything it could be called bob it could be used called troublesome whatever mean tastic i recommend global using or usings and let's go and have a look we can get rid of all of this let me zoom it zoom 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 and then anything i want i can take out of here we should see some squiggles. We've got red squiggles there under program and I'm going to drop that in here. And it's still red squiggles because I need the keyword global. And now you can see the red squiggles have gone and I've put this here because I think system.text.json in a web application is going to be used across multiple files. So I'm quite happy for that to be in my global usings. Now things that I'm probably not so happy is like uh, DTOs, I don't want those everywhere, or entities or something like that. So don't go crazy with plucking out all of your usings and bunging them into a global usings file. Um, only take the ones that you want everywhere. Uh, scoping is still a safe way to go. Okay, don't, don't scope everything. Don't start creating aliases because you've globally scoped everything. Do it with some common sense. All right. So we've got that, and now system.text.json is available everywhere. Okie dokie. So let's go down and have a look. We've got this var builder, which is pretty cool. Um, that's what we have. And what we had, if we go back in here, if you remember in our startup, no, 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 go away. We had our configuration, but we didn't have that straight out the box in that template. So what we need to do is within our builder, we have a configuration and we can start to add things to it. And we can add a JSON file, which is our app settings. Uh, you can say it's optional, all of those things that you've probably seen plenty of times. Um, uh, well, uh, please increase font editor size. You mean this bit on the left? Uh, I can, we can try that, but it's probably not, um, we're not going to be looking so much into that settings. Let's go. 
there we go hopefully that has improved it for you um so let me know colored northern okay so what we have here is configuration and we can add our json files add environment variables, add user secrets because they're still all there and then we can even add command line arguments and you can configure this however you want and then we can build it. We still have our controllers added and um, we have endpoints API that's to do with open API, Swagger and Swaggergen. So that's going to be our explorer which is kind of useful when you're developing. So then we come down, there's loads of notes in here so as I add stuff in if you come to look at this um, on GitHub, you'll see the notes in there. We build it and then we map stuff. And then I've got this minimal API down here. And it's pretty horrible. <laughs> so what have we got going on in here? I have this um, uh, HTTP client with a using. So I'm, I'm basically newing up a client because my ingredient surface needs this client. Um, my waffle creation service needs the ingredient service because we're talking about waffles. I forgot to say, I always talk about food. I love talking about food. Uh, so today is waffles, sometimes it's tacos, but today it's waffles. So I need to new up all of these things to go in here. This makes it really horrible. Goodness knows how many clients I'm creating, who's managing those. I mean, we hope that um, it's going to be managed for us, but uh, you know, who knows? Um, it's all just pretty gnarly, but I should think it works. So what I'm going to do is just go back over here and we can close this file. How do I, how do I escape you? Oh my God. I can't, I can't escape. <laughs> Oh, Visual Studio Code has dominated the world. That was crazy. All right. Uh, so I am going to CD up out of here and I have an API in here. And that is under ingredients API. So we're going to CD into that ingredients API. And uh, let's go and have a quick look at that. And this is an Azure function. And this is going to serve up our ingredients. And I've got this because later on, we're going to show some resilience with this. So let's have a quick look. Uh, we don't want it doing that. We want it to always return. Yeah. Good. Okay. So we're just going to get it to always return positive for now. And now we can go uh, funk start, and then I think it's C sharp like so. You need to do this because it's a, you know, nested projects. Oh, go, go. All right, we are booting our Azure function we should get an API. Fantastic. There we go. There's our endpoint. Uh, so now we have that running. Let's go back over here. Uh, so in my ingredient service, it's already doing that. I am going to see if I can get a, a new window up. Let's have that. Yeah. Let's just get a guest one. It's, no, that's not what I want. <laughs> I know. I can have one up here. There we go. All right. So now we've got that. Let's go and press play. Don't just don't mind all those warnings. It's all good. Alrighty. So what we have here is Swagger has given us a lovely uh, explorer. And you can see these two are from the controller that we have. And this one, which is in the root namespace, is um, the one we have here. And we can see that get waffle toppings, get waffle toppings. And yeah, of course it's going to work. She says, please work. Yay, it worked. <laughs> this was that like, oh my God, it's not going to work. Uh, we've got a whole load of toppings so that's come from the ABR API that we've created and then some bases. So already we've got that. 
but we can do so much better um, because I totally don't want to be new and hit these up, not when I have a dependency injection. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, whip these out. And I'm going to bring those up here where I like to do all of my dependencies. So I'm going to drop them down there for now so we know what we need. Um, first thing we're going to do is builder dot services dot add HTTP client. So we've got that. That's our first one. And now I can get rid of this line. And that's going to use the HTTP client factory out the box. And that's going to manage all of our clients. It will stop us getting uh, socket exhaustion. It's going to cycle all the pools and all the kids will have fun splashing around and it will all be managed for us. And we don't need to worry about it. Um, so now the next thing, and that's just a generic HTTP client like we created. Um, but I will show you in a little bit how we can be more clever with that. So now we're going to do builder.services.add. Let's add a singleton. Uh, there are three lifecycle states. We have singleton, we have uh, scoped, and we have transient. We probably won't have time to go into those. Now, Waffle Ingredient Service, if I head over to that, um, you can see it has that dependency of HTTP client. It's not implementing an interface, and then it just goes and gets some stuff. So when we come to do that, we need to, there's no interface, so we're just going to ask for an instance of that. Boom, that line can go. Uh, now, the last one we need is the Waffle Creation Service, and this does have a, an implementation of the iWaffle Creation Service. So we've got two implementations of this. So there's several ways that we could inject this, um, and I probably won't have a control, uh, a control. I totally have control. I'm <laughs> totally in control. Time to go in here and look at the different ways that we can inject those, which I have listed in there. But if you are looking at the project, there are all the different ways that you can consume um, one of these. So what I'm actually going to do is we're going to work with the interface. And this is, I like doing this because if you change the implementation, um, you only change it in one place in your program. And you don't need to go and change it in all the places that consume it. Because if with my waffle ingredient service, if I go and if I want to change the implementation of that without an interface, I have to go and find all the places that's used and swap it. However, if I go with add singleton here uh, for I waffle creation service, and I can say I want this implementation, please, when an application requests it. And equally, if I wanted a different one, which is called another Waffle creation service, I could just go like that and that would be used across my application. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to stick with this implementation, but then we need to go back down to our API because you're like, ah, you left that all with broken code. I so did. And just like you can with a controller, um, you can just inject a service straight into this anonymous function. Um, so I've just injected iWaffle creation service here. And um, let's go and run and see if that works. And we'll try it out. Let's execute. And we've got a whole load of toppings and it totally worked. Fantastic. Uh, so you can see we've just quickly refactored into a nice way. But dun, dun, dun. one of my biggest issues with this way of doing code in a long, big sort of script style, because this looks like a script. This doesn't look like C Sharp that I'm familiar with from years and years of working with it. This is like very alien when I first saw it. It's going to get messy. Can you imagine if I add every service? You've got a big application, you're adding every service, but hey, we can tidy this up. And it's a really simple way of doing it. So I'm going to going to get these out. And I've written some extensions. And I love writing extensions. So let's just minimize this, make it super big for Khaled. And what we're going to do is extend our iService collection. 
So I've stubbed out a thing here already, but the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the name of our class. Uh, firstly, it has to be static because we're going to be extending um, iService collection, so it has to be static. But then you can call it whatever you like. Now here it's called dependency service collection extensions, but I have actually been enjoying calling it iService collection extensions. And you'll see it's squiggly because that's already been used elsewhere. And that's because I have been experimenting with having them as partial classes. You may be going, get away with me, Ugh, partial, Ugh. but each your own. You can call it whatever you like. So I like to call them all partial class and then independently um, the name of the file is what they're doing. That's just my preference. So now we're going to write the actual extension which is public static and it needs to return, let me just minimize that, so we've got maximum screen size and we're going to have iService collection. This is going to be called add dependencies, dependencies, and there we go. Okay, so because this is a method chain and we're extending it, we need to use the uh, keyword this, and we are going to ask for i service collection, and let's just call that services. Awesome. Uh, and the last thing we need to do is return something resembling that, which is return services. And now we've written our extension and we can shove whatever we like in here. So let's do exactly that. I'm going to just rename those and I've brought all of those over. And to consume this, I now go back over into program. Why are you upset? What's your problem? It's fine. It's just being a bit slow. So now I can go builder.services. And because this extends our service collection, it's there. And those dependencies are added. Now let's just do a quick test. And we'll get it, try it out, execute. And we've got all of our toppings. Awesome. Um, what I want to do just quickly in here is just cover um, a topic that I never came across what one of my teammates asked me about. Um, so I'm going to cover it. And this is about private dependencies. And I'd love to know people's thoughts on this um, and see what you think. So the idea is if you have a, an, a service that depends on something that you don't wish to be globally available. OK, so let's go down and have a look. And this is it, Steve. Steve Talks Code. So good old Steve Collins really helped me with all of this understanding things and has written a wonderful series of blogs on managing life cycles and, and things like that and I disposable. So I strongly recommend checking out the blogs. All right. So what you will see often is uh, someone will new this up and that's okay. We've, we've newed up this marketing private dependency. If it does do I disposable, make sure you're calling I dispose, uh, uh, dispose, not I dispose, dispose on it and make sure you're dealing with that because we've newed that up. There's nothing managing its life cycle. So what I have seen is, and is really what? on earth was that? So we're going to have builder.services. I have, <laughs> it's because I'm using builder services <laughs> dot uh, add singleton. And then I see um, no type and we're just going to add MD. Okay. And that's happy. But because we created this outside, say this had um, implemented iDisposable, our IOC container is not going to manage that life cycle, okay? Because it has no awareness of when it's created or anything like that. So this is this is a a bit of a code smell. If this doesn't need to be disposed of and and then don't worry too much about it, but let's just assume it did. So then what we need to do is add it like so. We're going to add it to the context, which is our service provider. And then we can add it like this. And now it's newing it up within the context. So our IOC container will manage this. Um, and then 
this one here is still private and it's not being globally shared, but this one, which has a dependency on that, is getting added to our IOC container and is globally available. So that's uh, just one thing I wanted to cover. Now, this is a way that you can order your dependencies as well. You can have loads of private um, methods in here, and then you can extend them here. So for example, we could have services dot add marketing dependencies. So you can further subdivide up your applications however you need to. I'm just going to comment that out because I don't want that interfering with anything. So perfect. We now have time for a drink. <sighs> okay, so we've got this really nice thing here um, and we can also do this for our databases. Um, all right, so um, do, 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 do. Uh, we'll just add it here. Um, and I'm going to cheat because no one needs to see me fumble through this. You're all going to be why are you all having a little? There you go. You're all coming happy now. They were just all a little bit unhappy. Um, all right. So just as before, let me just minimize this. This is a really long one. So I'm going to try and zoom in and pan. I've extended uh, iService Collection for databases. And this one is slightly different because we have our services.addDBContext and then our type of DBContext, which is Waffle DB context. And then we have all of these options. And this one happens to be SQL Server. But what do we need for our database instance? We need to know the connection string. And this is coming from our um, app settings. You can see in here connection strings, default SQL, <laughs> Yay. go me, not doxing myself, it's set in user secrets. So because we added all of this here, that will be pulled in and available. But how do we get our connection string from this into here? And that's because I'm going to pass our configuration. So I can go and say config.get connection string default SQL, so that's all convention based and inject that. And then when I come to use our add database um, in here, we can go builder.services and we're gonna do add databases. And in here, you can see it's unhappy because it needs, not this first part, because remember that's just saying this is the extension, it needs the configuration. So we can just go and grab it, which is builder configuration done perfect so nice and clean again we don't have all of that big long wide code messing up in here uh so you can see i've got loads of notes in here and uh well that looks pretty good but there is more that we can do to make this tidy we could have another drink now something different right so I want to go back to our add dependencies. Now, remember when I spoke about our HTTP client and I said this was just a generic one and we have this waffle ingredient service that requires an HTTP client. Well, we can go and make this even better. Yes, it's a word, do not question me. My mum told me it was a word, better. Okay, let me just uh, get rid of some of these here. And I'm loving all the comments about waffles and your favorite waffles. Uh, my favorite waffle is a proper big fluffy waffle with sliced fresh strawberries, uh, vanilla ice cream, whipped cream, and chocolate drizzled all over the top. Oh my God, it's like heaven, heaven. Icy cold, like mm, strawberries. Mm, I deserve one of those now after this talk, but I won't get one. Um, Anyway, moving swiftly on, uh, I have another extension called Clients and Policies. This is a really fun area. So I'm going to just minimize this and let's go zooming in. So just like before, you can see I've got public static partial class iService collection extensions, and I've called this one um, Add Clients and Policies. 
And that was because, let me just drop what we had. Uh, we had HTTP client. That's great. That's generic. But if I remind you this here, do something magical with this. So I'm actually just going to get rid of that. Now, this, as I mentioned earlier, is HTTP client factory behind it. Um, so we're going to do a named one. And this is, where's my cursor? There we go. Services dot add uh, HTTP client. And this time, rather than just that, I'm going to give it a name. Uh, you see, it comes up. Name, uh, let's go JetBrains. And then here, we can start to customize this particular one. And let's go down onto a new line. And then you can treat it just as you would if you were creating your client or adding things to your client in after you've newed it up or injected it. So here we can go client dot base address is equal to new URI. And in here we can go HTTP uh, S something, I don't know, something dot com, whatever it is, okay? Um, and here you can go and add whatever you need. You can do your headers, you can do your cores, <laughs> cores, despicable things. It's always cores, isn't it, Rachel? Always cores. So um, you can go and customize it all here. And then you would go and I'm going to, I'm totally going to mess this up, but let's go and have a go anyway. I'm so, I haven't practiced this for a while. So let's just say we were asking for that. Um, we can go, I'm so going to mess this up, live coding at its finest. I can go, give me an HTTP client factory. Uh, there it is. And let's just call it fac. Um, and then we can go fact dot create client. And then I think we can give it a name. We totally can. And then we can just say, can you give me JetBrains? And now we can just say, oh, let's go uh, client equals, oh my God, I, there you go. And now um, I, that would be a var. Well, actually it'd be a read only. It would be done properly because this isn't any use to anyone. But that's how you can go and fetch that HTTP client and now use it. So you inject the entire factory at this stage. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, but let's go and see even cooler stuff. That's a word too. So coming down here, I'm going to add a strongly typed one. Just ignore this line here for a moment. So we can go services dot add HTTP client. You can see, right, it's giving me my angle brackets. And this one is going to be waffle ingredients. <laughs> Waffle, some random mashing of keys, Waffle Ingredient Service. Boom, amazing. Now, this has handled it all for me. It's made it its own HTTP client and I didn't need the two-step thing. I didn't need to add a client and I didn't need to do it as a singleton. It's all done for me, it's magical. And now I have a strongly typed HTTP client that I can inject in places. So. That's all handled, managed for me, and it's awesome, and I love it, and that's great. But what else can we do with HTTP clients? Well, let's go and have a quick look at our ingredients API. Now, at the moment, this is going to always return, nearly always if I'm connected to the internet, um, a good result. You see, it's like, all is good, everything's peachy, but that is not the case of the internet, is it? Because no, that is definitely not the case. Um, so this is now going to work 50% of the time. Uh, let's just go and restart that function. Let's go control C, restart. And you can see that, we'll come back over. And now, let me go and run this. But first, let me just bring the clients and policies and add that. Don't don't forget to add these. I've already got it here. All right, so that's all peachy. And let's go and stop and run. So hopefully 
this should all go. But now we might not always get a positive. So let's go and see. If I execute, I didn't get any toppings. It failed. And if we go over here, we see error, error. It's really angry. Now, I'm miserable because I don't have any toppings on my waffle. And this is not great for our end user. They're like, oh, do they not have any toppings? Do I just get a plain waffle? Boringness. Um, so let's see if we can make that better by adding in some resiliency to our application. Okay, so I'm gonna just close some of these. And that's what I've got here. And I'm gonna use Polly. And if we look in here, uh, I've got Poly Circuit Breaker. You've also, and I've got Poly. So that's just a new get package brought in. And that is Windows.Poly, something like that. It's Windows, did I really say that? Um, let's just have a quick look at what it is. It is Microsoft, yes, not Windows. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, it's definitely not Windows. <laughs> So it's Microsoft extensions and then HTTP.poly. So we're going to bring it in like that. And that brings in poly just to use. So we've got that. I'm going to do a circuit breaker. And let, I should really explain what a circuit breaker is. So let's do that now. Um, I have a lovely picture of a circuit breaker. Now, if you are familiar with electric, trickery stuff that's in your house you know you have circuits and you have a circuit breaker and that's like if you trip the circuit all your power goes off and you have to go and flip the little switches okay that's basically the pattern we are using in our software closed is good that means we've got a continuous loop it's closed the responses are traveling and what we can do is set a failure threshold so we'll say if it fails x number of times Let's flick open the circuit breaker and stop because something is obviously wrong. And then this could be because the service that we're making requests to is having a wobbly. It's down for the count. It's waiting for its pod to come back up. It's, it's just not there. It's overloaded. It's, it's just having a timeout. So what we're going to do is set in a delay and then hope that that other application gets itself sorted. And to test that, we're going to send one response. And that's what half open is. And we'll send one response. Ah, oh no, it's still all gone. Kablam. Let's open that circuit again. And then we wait again for a longer period of time. However, if we send a request in, a test one, and it's like, yep, dealing with that, it's like, oh, okay, let's uh, close the circuit and start sending off our traffic again. So that's basically what happens. So let's go and see that in practice. And I have a fair few different things going on here. Uh, there's a great series of blogs on the twilio.com site. I can't for the life of me remember the author of them um, at the moment, but you can go and search Twilio and Polly um, and you'll get some great blogs on policy. And I use that for a lot of these ones here, which was where I found out about Rap Async. This was epic. I'm so pleased by this. So I have three different policies here. A fallback, which is like, oh, what do we do? What do we fall back on in it if everything goes wrong? How many things do we retry and when should we retry? And then what is our circuit breaker? So if I scroll down, the first one I've got here is my circuit breaker. So you can see my failure threshold is three. So that's the number of failures we'll do before we activate our circuit breaker. And then we've got the time span of a minute. And then we've got some things where we can do some logging on break, on reset, on half open. So you can see down here, we've got on half open, on reset, on break. So you can do some logging or whatever you need to do in that. Next one is retry. So this is going to say if the status code is not found, we're going to try again. And then we'll try three times. And then the fallback policy, well, this would be where you could redirect it somewhere else. You could pass a message. You can do whatever you need to do. And now we are going to add all of those to here. So we're going to go dot add uh, policy handler. And I'm just going to pass in 
the wrap in there. Okay, so I've wrapped them all nicely and I can add here. And you can have a different policy for each HTTP client. And I will say that the order these are in is very important as well. So there's a path that your response goes through and that's why these um, need to be in an order. So I'm just saying, if you look into it, you need to have a, um, make sure you get these in the right order and check out those blogs and the policy, uh, the poly docs as well. Um, so. What I'm now going to do is let's make our um, API fail every time. So if I do that and that and that. OK, so this is always going to say internal server error and error error. And I just need to restart this. And that's all peachy, so we'll come back over. All right, now I have a policy added to our HTTP client. I'm hoping that we're gonna see something better happen. So let's run it. Um, okay, so um, I see that Dave, um, Arnaldi, um, no, wait, uh, how's it, how do you inject a specific strongly typed HTTP client? Okay, so a specific strongly typed one is this Waffle Ingredient Service. And if I show you where that's required, and that is in our Waffle Creation Service, here it is. I've injected my strongly typed HTTP client, just like that. Um, so then it's ready to use and it's all dealt with and handled and that's it, that's it. You just use it like that. Um, okay, so let's go here. Now remember this is gonna fail. I'll just see out of fraction because what we'll expect is, um, I can, I tell you what I wanna do is bring this over onto the screen. Okay, because I'd like you to see all the error messages coming up. No, no, not you. Did I just close it? I did. Um, oh my God, oh no, that's, that's the wrong screen, that's why. Let's go here and we want that one on there, okay. This is the right one. I'm so confused then. I need to color code different instances of Rider. I bet you that's something I could do. So I'm expecting to see error, error here. Let's try it out. Okay, so we've got we've got an error it's still going. You see it hasn't done it. We've got another error still going. Remember our threshold was three. Error. You can see the time between each one. And now we're into our circuit breaker. Boom. Our circuit is open because we had three, the fourth failed. We've got our 500 and you can see the circuit is now open and is not allowing calls. So you can see how it tried three times and then it was like, nah, this isn't working. And now we've dealt with that. We can add in things there that would tell, that would add logging, that would tell the client, um, like, hey, we've got a problem, try again later, or here's an alternative. We've made our application so much more resilient rather than just like, oh, it's an empty list. I mean, how was that helping anybody? Um, that wasn't. This will do because you as the developer can do more things with it. So we've instantly increased our resiliency to our application. Fantastic, right. Now, what else did I need to tell? Minimal APIs, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. So there's our resiliency, that's great. We've got uh, 13 minutes, I know you've got questions. I'll be quick, I'll be quick. Let's go down here and have a look at this. Okay, this here is our API. And just like before, if we have loads of these in our program, it's gonna get pretty horrific. So I have an extension. I'm gonna take this one out and uh, we should stop. And let's go and have a look at this. 
So this one's a wasteable, yeah, you can totally do that. And then we can come over to not our services, we want our extensions. You can see I've got add APIs async. And you can order this however you wish. So let's drop this in. We've got it in and you could say have all your posts in one private, just like we did in um, add dependencies. You could have, I don't know, however you want to order them. You could have all of these different ones and then add them all like you've done this in one. So however you wish to do them and order, organize them. So here we have our injection, but what about a post? Um, because we can do all sorts of things that any of the verbs are available. And what I'm going to do is just copy that. So let's start by going map post, and it can have the same name because it's a, um, okay, and then we're going to go and make our anonymous function. Okay. So it, because it's, um, we're using the rest pattern, we can have them both with the same name. And let's say we still want our waffle creation service. Let's have that in. Uh, let's still have it async. And then let's go on to a new line. Um, actually, well, I won't bother with that. What are, what are we likely to do? We probably want to have something in our in a body, won't we? So if I have order, order, because that's what I'm going to say, I want to pass in my order to get my food, please. I want that. And what would we do in a controller? Well, we would put from body. And you can still do that in your API here. And then I can just go var o equals order, and we'll put a breakpoint on that. And we should hopefully see, not that, a vat of waffles and chocolate sauce. Mm -mm -mm. So let's put a breakpoint on that because I want to show you that you can still do your injection and your sort of like API stuff all in one go in this anonymous function. So let's hit debug. And you can see now we've got our get and our post. Swagger's so done its little job of finding stuff. So let's go and have a look in here. So it's telling us this is what uh, the order should look like. It knows what that looks like. Um, and now I'm just going to go like seven. Um, and let's say the base is a heart, just so we can see that it's done that. And I put my breakpoint on, didn't I? It did. And then when we execute, what I hope is that we will see a lovely model binding. We do, we have seven. If I extend this, we've got heart. So we've got it from the payload, from the body. We've mapped it to our, um, our object, just like you would in your controller. So that was the only quick thing I wanted to show you with that and how to just lay out your minimal APIs in a nice way. You can see they totally work with controllers as well. So if you do a mixture because that's what you need, then that's great. Um, so yeah, I like that's how I like to do it. I'm very open to ideas and suggestions. One thing about minimal APIs, I had a link to it there, is that if you were doing CRUD, create, read, update, delete, uh, stuff and you had in all your entities, uh, you could use something like uh, Jeff Fritz's instant APIs. And what that does is it goes and looks at your DB context, I believe, and it goes to see what you have set. And then based on what you have set in your DB, it will go and create all of the uh, CRUD methods, API methods for you uh, so you can do that. So that's pretty cool if you need something explorable. Uh, I haven't um, I haven't used that yet. It's still under active development. Uh, so I don't know how testable that a instant API is, is yet. Um, I also have a stronger version to having entities surfaced. Um, so that's a judgment call. I'm, I'm like entities to DTOs, please. I don't like entities to come to the surface apart from in a demo when I call order, 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 because 
this is totally not the DTO. This should be DTO. This thing. Let's bring that in. Did I have that? Uh, somewhere, we'll just ignore that now. But I don't normally like to have entity surface like that, uh, so you need to make a judgment call with that. Uh, just seeing his serializer here, you can add custom serializers to your DI, um, and so how you then would manage how something, um, your JSON is deserialized to your models, uh, so you can do the capitalization and everything, you can do that as an object. I don't have time to go into that, but you can totally do that. Uh, so I hope this has given you some inspiration and confidence to go ahead and work with the minimal hosting, uh, sorry, the top level statements. This is the minimal hosting pattern as well because it's minimal. Um, everything's built off it. Um, it's both top level statements and minimal hosting. Uh, I really like it. Um, as I say, I hated it when I first started, but I've grown to love it and it's very flexible. Um, and if you develop it correctly using some common sense and uh, forethought on how you architect your system and structure your code, I think it's really um, powerful and very quick and easy for people to get a hold of and, and understand what's going on in your code. So yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, let's see. Have we got any questions that I, I haven't addressed? Okay, we're back. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I've been accused of nodding too much when listening to speakers. So I'm kind of glad I'm not on the video while you're talking because I was nodding the whole time. I love yeah. a nodder. I focus <laughs> on the nodder. I'm like, yes, there's my person in the audience. <laughs> yeah, it's, especially when you said don't surface your entities. Uh, yeah, I was nodding a lot because to your point, Maybe your DTOs slightly, you know, mutate and change because that's what your user wants and it doesn't match totally. your database. Yeah. So um, like really good point. In the examples here, this doesn't look anything like my ingredients object. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's completely different. And especially I think because I I started with MVC and you always wanted your view model to be exactly what the view was. So you were never passing your entity to the view because you would have your entity thing as part of the view. And you might have a like a select list, you know, if your drop downs in there, you'd have everything in there. So I always was very much like entities are to do with data in that way in the back end. And then you have okay. something that serves the front end and they're very separate. Yeah, ex excellent point. I think you also mentioned a lot of like the multi-paradigm hosting model that ASP.NET Core has kind of evolved into. Yeah. And I really love that about ASP.NET Core. The fact that you can jump from Razor pages to controllers, to minimal APIs, to Blazor and now Blazor components. Uh, yeah. Which one of them are your favorite? Like if you had to build an app tomorrow, like which ones would you pick out of that basket? <laughs> I mean, I've I've played a lot with Blazor, mm -hmm. um, and I've given talks on Blazor, and I do enjoy it. But I, <laughs> I don't like being in the front end anymore. I I mean, I when I was an engineer, I was full stack, but I'm so like I like being in the back where it's all objective and there's no subjectivity on the margins and the borders, and I'm so done with that. So <laughs> I love being in the back. I love. Um, I love doing stuff with APIs. So I think I'd like to explore more with minimal APIs and, and see how clever I can get with those. So that's kind of where my thoughts are going with, with mm -hmm. doing that. And I, as you say, I love being able to mix and match and bring everything that I need into the application. I think one of my notes here is um, we have everything that we need and nothing that we don't because you can just bring in what you need um, and there's no limitation. Yeah, ex excellent point. Uh, Rachel, what did you think when you were watching Layla give that expert level talk? Yes, well, I had the fortunate opportunity to actually see this last week <laughs> also, so because we were at a conference together. Um, but uh, yeah, I like the promotion of the separation of concerns and components, which is um, once you go to this minimal model, 
it's not separate anymore. It's kind of at this point up to you to do some of this and that's what's happening in this nice way. And the same thing with the DTOs, right? Not uh, just surfacing that model. It has to go through this uh, separation point and you have that nicely loosely coupled layer for mm -hmm. it. So those, those sort of things. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, a question for both of you, because Kevin Griffin asked this question early on in the talk, uh, is the minimum API approach uh, fulfilling the prophecy of bringing more people into the .NET ecosystem? I know that's kind of like a philosophical question. There's no real hard data for us to talk about, but what, what are your thoughts? Does it make it easier for folks to get into .NET? Actually, I think there is hard data. It's just that we don't have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think there are still, when you look at this, what we get with the basic out of the box um, template, there's still um, a lot of complexity for new folks there. Um, some people don't have dependency injection in their language. Mm -hmm. um, so coming over here and being presented straight away with builder.services and they're like, wait, wait, what? What are these things? Um, so I do think there is a little bit of a, a sharp hill to get started. And I think that's inevitable when you look at like JavaScript or, or Python, there's none of that. You can just get straight in. Whereas you're presented with these, well, I think, good coding practices straight off the bat. But if you're new to it and um, coming from another language, I, I think there's still that little bit of a learning curve that you have to go. You can't just go, yep, this makes total sense. There's parity between this and Express.js or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, it's interesting too, because on Twitter, you kind of see the different languages and paradigms and kind of their strengths and their weaknesses. And you kind of mentioned it like with Express, you have this like dynamic language where you can yeah. do things and like enrich objects as they go through the pipeline, but C sharp statically typed, there is a lot more, uh, I guess JavaScript people would say like ceremony to getting into C sharp, right? For sure. Uh, and that could be a little difficult. So um, let me look through, you know, you kind of mentioned it and I was thinking about it when you were going through this talk, you've kind of figured out a way to manage complexity in a minimal hosting style app. Um, but have you seen a different approach to managing complexity that you find like interesting? Uh, yeah. No, um, I, I don't, I haven't seen many people addressing the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a chat with um, Jeff Fritz about it and he, with his instant APIs, he had some stuff and we sort of spoke about different ways to manage it. Um, and it just doesn't seem to be covered when I've looked at it. I'd love people to point me to some stuff where um, it's managed differently because um, this sort of managing of it is the way that it works in my brain. And mm -hmm. that may not work for everybody's brain. Um, so if people have different ways of managing this complexity and, and really dealing with it. I mean, maybe people are just extending builder and taking services out into something else. I, I don't know. Maybe they're doing that sort of thing and they're taking it on up an, an even higher level. I don't know. Um, what I do try to do is not mix my own um, dependencies with framework dependencies. So I, I try to leave things like these ones, which I consider framework ones, Mm -hmm. there or I will take I have toyed with um taking those out into like framework dependencies but I don't like to mix them in with my own ones because I think that um that leads to jumbledness and doesn't improve the quality of the code oh okay yeah I mean those are those are really good points and like good advice too I think I never really thought about the difference between my services and the framework stuff but that's a really really good point so yeah um, you could, if you wanted to, take them all out and just dump all of the framework services in there and third party. But I, I like to have my own stuff and then maybe third party and then, you know, framework. You can organize it however you see fit. That's kind of the beauty of it. Um, I have just seen a question. So let me just um, do this. And I need to I need to manage my screen so I can still see you. Your wallpaper is going to eat us. 
is um it's from bing and it's today it is it's orca sculpture <laughs> it's terrifying that's what that is <laughs> i have nightmares it, it looks like it's also hungry for waffles <laughs> oh yes i'm i'm really almost hungry now uh so the question was hello come on oh my god we've lost everything let's go back and open it was where is this code publicly available and it's here mm -hmm. on layla hyphen p yep I, uh we'll be sure to get that link from you and put it in the show notes when we publish these videos on youtube so folks perfect. can kind of get that from there yeah you can go and check it out um yeah i do i do love this this background <laughs> it's it's pretty if you were stumbling through the forest like I often do, I'm I'm a real um, nemophilist and tree bather. I think I might like fall on my butt and like squeal like a, a little piglet if I yeah. saw this. Yeah, I would think I would be in a horror movie if I saw that and uh, not good things are coming up next for me. So um, I guess one last question, an easy question. What writer theme are you using right now? Because that's an interesting color. This one is Ocean dark or something i got yelled at last week presenting on like a big led screen in a light mode okay <laughs> it's like why you're burning my eyes it was came up in my questions at the end um so this is deep ocean theme and i always switch to abrima that's the the font i like and i use dank mono as my uh mono based font um yep. So yeah, and I, I both talks people ask me how I got my Nyan cat progress bar as well. <laughs> so uh, there was some uh, there was some good plugging of stuff over there. My light theme, which burns your eyes, is melon light. There you go, lovely. Um, it's so, funny. It's it's like a holy war. You can't really please anybody. You right. know, the dark mode people are going to want dark mode. The light mode people are going to want light mode. Uh, I think we just flash themes at a high pace and then everyone can go. have theme yeah the just oh 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy with both it depends on my mood and my ambient lighting i'm really not bothered as long as i can read the the font um and i zoom in onto everything and as long as i think it's more the fonts that mm -hmm. i like rather than the themes yeah. as long as it's not hot dog on code <laughs> oh yeah that ketchup theme is uh that's weird oh geez it's wrong so very wrong <laughs> i don't know the older i get the more of a light theme i need like the worse my eyes get when i was younger i could do more of a darker theme um is... so clearly there's some kind of weird eye issue for me i think for some other rachel are we entering boomer territory are we, <laughs> are we in trouble now <laughs> i'm saying i need it i need it too is what i'm saying we're gonna join a boomer club, Rachel. We're not. We're not that old yet. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Although I've seen, I've seen some folks tell me I'm old, so maybe I am old. It's old fun. in the brain, Khalid. That's oh. a, there's a bit difference between physically and mentally. I mean, oh. You did yell at them kids to get off your lawn. I did. I did actually the other day because they were freaking my dogs out, and I was like, these kids better get off my lawn. And then I was like, oh, geez, I'm a Clint Eastwood meme come to life um but, Pylon, you dark theme using kids <laughs> uh so yeah i mean i guess one last question for you layla and then we'll kind of let you go and uh bring on our next speaker but uh have you looked at any of the dotnet 7 improvements towards minimal apis and which ones uh if you have which ones are you kind of excited about no I have, um, I am sick and tired of living on the bleeding edge. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have absolutely refused to look at anything for a .NET 7 RP. <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you. I'm the same way. Like I, I used to chase that like very, the minute the bits would come out and it, it's just too tiring when you actually have other stuff to do. It's uh, just yeah. too much, too much changes too yeah. quickly. You I know, did it with Blazor on the bleeding edge and it was so very painful. And I've seen people go through it with Maui and I'm like, mm -mm -mm, nope, yep. not me. <laughs> and I am waiting for .NET 7 to come out and be released, but I'm not updating anything to .NET 7 because, you know, it's not an LTS. So, um, you know, 
I am I am waiting for .NET eight next, and .NET seven can push oh. off. Oh, that's con that's a spicy take. That's a hot. Yeah, take. spicy. I like this. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, we're, oh, oh man, we're gonna. All yeah. right. That's Layla it. speaks for We're herself. We're going to so people. misquote you on this every time. I know. <laughs> I'm so totally going to be in .NET 7. But at the moment, I'm like, no, uh, no, I'm waiting till .NET 8. I won't, you know, but you know. <laughs> I, I feel your pain, though, because I wrote a blog post about a .NET 7 preview feature. And then someone DM'd me and said, hey, this thing doesn't exist. And I was like, what do you mean it doesn't exist? <laughs> So I went and pulled out my code, and yeah, the, all the APIs and interfaces were renamed. So like I bang bang and yeah. and all of these things that they oh no community doesn't <laughs> like it let's toss it out. I'm see this is it. I'm waiting for the official V1. That's it. I'm yeah. I I these fingers are burnt to crisp, and I'm not getting in there. <laughs> yep. So um, yeah, on, on that note, it was a pleasure having you here. This talk was great. Uh, Rachel enjoyed it so much she watched it twice. So that's 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 crazy, <laughs> right? She's that's a glutton good. for punishment. That one. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you, and uh, yeah, uh, all your uh, links uh, we'll put in the notes once we publish this video. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you again. Uh, it's a great pleasure. So I would uh, love to come back and cause mayhem. So it's <laughs> hey, fine. That's that's our brand, chaos. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways. <laughs> uh, thank you thank so much you. for having me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Yeah.